Okay, well, welcome and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Rachel Dunham and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator with the Xerces Society. And we are joined today by Candace Fallon, who is our Senior Conservation Biologist in the Endangered Species Program. She's also our Firefly Lead. So thank you again for joining us today. We're so happy to have you all here and I will hand it over to Candace. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rachel. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, like Rachel said, my name is Candace Fallon and I'm a senior conservation biologist and our firefly lead in the endangered species program here at Xerces. And today I'm gonna to be presenting fireflies, getting to know the jewels of the night. So we're gonna cover some basic life history information and some fun facts about fireflies. And then also talk about some of the threats to their populations and recommendations for what you can do to help protect fireflies and their habitat. So before we begin, I just want to say thank you to all of our partners and supporters, um, Cersei Society members and the many firefly researchers who have shared their knowledge with us and really dedicated so much time to understanding these amazing animals. Uh, we really couldn't do this work without all of you. Your donations really make work like this possible. We are a donor supported nonprofit, so if you'd like to donate or become a member, please do visit our website. If you're not familiar with the Xerces Society, we are a science based nonprofit dedicated to the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. We were established in 1971 by Robert Michael Pyle. And we're named after the Xerces blue butterfly, which is the first butterfly in the US thought to go extinct due to human development. And this species was once found in the coastal sand dunes of the San Francisco Bay Area. Xerces now has over 50 staff members across the country. And we work on everything from education and outreach to research, on the ground restoration, advocacy, and other applied conservation efforts. And our programs focus on endangered species conservation, uh, pollinator conservation, pesticide reduction, and community engagement. A large component of our work involves compiling and disseminating the latest research and findings from folks in the field and in labs and um, research offices all over the world. And so as part of this, we produce a large number of publications. And this includes everything from installation guides and plant lists to monitoring protocols, species fact sheets, conservation guidelines, and many others. So all of these are available in our publications library on our website. And several of the resources that I'll talk about today are actually available in this library. So I recommend checking it out if you haven't already. So let's dive into fireflies. Uh, I think many of us can agree on the aesthetic value of fireflies. If you had the opportunity to see flashing fireflies on a summer night, you know that they have this almost magical quality uh, that they bring to the landscape. And fireflies have really captured the human imagination for centuries. They're often the focus of art and literature and different cultural traditions. Uh, these incredible nighttime displays, especially those put on by the synchronous fireflies, are particularly inspiring. And they've really started to spur and have spurred for a long time in some places a growing ecotourism sector, both in the US and abroad. Uh, but fireflies have a lot of other values as well. Ecologically, they're important components of community food webs, both as predators and prey. And they've also played important roles in biomedical research. For this first section, I have a few interactive polls I'd like to share, uh, like Rachel mentioned, and these are anonymous, so please join in. Um, bear with me while I remember how to do this. Okay, so fireflies are known by many different names, including lightning bugs and glowworms. But what kind of invertebrates are they? And I'll give you all about 30 seconds to Submit your answers here. All right. Okay, I'm going to end the poll here. 
So it looks like we have a few folks for flies, true bugs, and worms. Um, some of you aren't sure, but the vast majority of folks voted for beetles. Um, so that's correct. Uh, fireflies, which are also called lightning bugs and glowworms, are in fact beetles in the order Coleoptera, and they're within the family um, Lampyridae. So fireflies are found on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, this brings me to my next question. We have another poll here. Uh, about how many species of fireflies do you think we have in the U.S. and Canada? I'm going to pull this up. Okay. Again, I'll give you all about 30 seconds. It's so cool to see everyone voting in real time. All right, looks like most people have entered an answer. I'm gonna stop this. So we have quite a varied number of responses. Um, some folks said one, um, kind of tied for 10 to 100. Uh, a lot of folks said 50. Um, or 150. And so, um, it's, you know, I think a lot of folks think it's easy to think of the fireflies as a single species, and I certainly did at one point, but there are actually over 150 species in the US and Canada. And we have more than 2,000 described species worldwide, uh, which is a pretty great diversity of fireflies. And so, as you can see from this map on the screen, fireflies can be found in every state except Hawaii in the US. Um, and it, they're also found in many Canadian provinces and territories. So as you look at this map, the darker the green, uh, the more firefly species that are documented in that state or province. And this is based on kind of some preliminary data for a database we've been pulling together. So it's not complete, but I think it still gives us a pretty good sense of where fireflies are. And those of you who live in the Western US or Canada might be surprised to see that we do in fact have fireflies out west. It's pretty fun for those of us like myself who live in Portland, Oregon, uh, to know that they are still out there. I have one last poll. Um, this next one is true or false? All firefly species flash as adults. Let me pull this up. Mm. Okay, hopefully that went out to you all. Here we go. So again, I'll give everyone about 30 seconds. All right, looks like most of you have voted. So we have about 26% saying true, all firefly species flash as adults, and 74% saying false. And that is actually correct. The answer is false. Not all fireflies flash as adults. Um, while the larvae of all of our species do produce light, the adults of some species glow instead of flashing, and then other species may not light up at all. Um, and so while flashing fireflies, like the one on the basil plant on the right, are pretty well known, fireflies are a diverse group of beetles with different life histories, different habitat associations, and different courtship activities. And this kind of rules um, you know, whether or not they use light and in what way. So all three insects you see on this slide are actually adult fireflies. And each one of these uses a pretty different form of communication. Um, you have your flashing firefly on the basil. 
Then you also have the California pink glowworm on the top left. Uh, that that's an adult female. It's glowing to attract a male mate. Um, and then on the bottom left, we have a day active, non flashing species um, that doesn't you know, use a lantern at all. So this common name firefly includes not only our familiar flashing species, um, which support each other by exchanging different patterns of flashes or flickers, um, but also the more cryptic glowworms. Um, and our, our day active species. And so fireflies actually partition their courtship activity into different times of night, ranging from dusk to full dark. So each species may have a little niche in which they're actually um, communicating to each other and they're active. And so I know a lot of folks who get to see fireflies in the summer are familiar with them at dusk, but they're actually species that um, may be coming out, you know, after midnight or pretty late in the night that you may not be seeing. So our more conspicuous flashing species do occur primarily in the east. Um, and here on the left, we have a Paractamina larva, which uh, these species in this genus tend to pupate on the furrowed bark of trees. And then on the right, we have a Faturus with its characteristic hunchback shape. Um, and so flashing species like these can be found in some localized areas of the west. We've actually had reports um, from places like Colorado, Wyoming, Nevada, and Utah, um, which is pretty fun. They're pretty isolated populations, but um, there's this hope for those of us in the West that we might see a flashing firefly one day. Um, but probably the most famous flashing species are the synchronous fireflies. And these are the ones that light up by the hundreds or even thousands um, all together, seeming to flash in unison. And probably the most famous site in the U.S. for this is Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, you can see them usually this time of year, uh, lighting up the summer sky. So out west, we primarily have glowworms and day active fireflies. And glowworms, like flashing fireflies, are active during dusk or night. And they also use bioluminescence to communicate. Um, and so the males look like your typical firefly, but the glowworm female actually resembles a larva and they can't fly. Usually they don't have any wings or their wings are pretty short. Um, so here on the left, you can see a Douglas fir glowworm. This is an adult male. Looks pretty similar to what you would think of as a firefly, although its wings are a little, um, I'm not really sure what's going on there. Um, and then on the right, you can see an adult female. Thomas, and so you'll note she looks um, much more like a larva, and you can actually see her reduced wing pads, um, the little black markings um, kind of just behind the head there. Um, so females are not capable of flight, and in these types of fireflies, the, the females glow from the ground to attract mostly non-luminescent males that are flying overhead searching for them. Our daytime dark fireflies, um, whose adults, as their name suggests, are active during the day, appear to rely on chemical pheromones rather than bioluminescence to communicate. Um, so this alichnia that you see on the left is often one of the first fireflies you might encounter each year. And this is true um, from east to west. Uh, one of my coworkers actually just sent me a photo of an alichnia from her yard. Um, and she saw it a week or two ago. So they can come out pretty early, um, as early as February. And this is because the adults are actually overwintering on tree trunks. Um, so when there's a warm, sunny day, even kind of late in the winter, they might become active. So like all beetles, fireflies undergo a complete metamorphosis, and that has four life stages. You have the egg, the pupa, the larva, and an adult. And the larvae and pupae of many species live underground for fireflies. Um, although some species, um, like the or sorry, like the Pyrectomina, um, a flashing firefly, they actually pupate on the side of trees. And so, as I said, the female glowworms are flightless, and they also live underground. Um, and as larvae, fireflies are really voracious predators of soft-bodied invertebrates. Uh, most adults don't feed, although there are some exceptions to this, but the larvae 
who appear to especially favor things like snails, slugs, and earthworms, like you can see in this photo here. So fireflies actually spend the vast majority of their lives as larvae, um, you know, hunting for prey on the soil, uh, mostly hanging out on the ground surface. They might take shelter in leaf litter or rocks or stumps, um, rotting logs, things like that. Um, and they might be in the stage for up to two years or more, whereas the adults tend to live for only a few weeks in the summer. So there are, of course, exceptions to that as well, like the alignia that I was just describing where the adults overwinter on trees and those live for much longer. So fireflies are probably best known for their light, makes sense. And this light is produced through a chemical reaction um, that actually involves an enzyme called luciferous. And firefly bioluminescence is thought to have evolved as a warning signal to alert predators that they're distasteful or toxic. Um, so we think over time, some of these species kind of co-opted this bioluminescence that was originally used by larva and started using it as an adult courtship signal. So like I said, all firefly larvae do produce light, um, although not all adults do. So different species can actually emit different wavelengths or colors of light. And these can vary from green to yellow to red. So if you're out on a summer night and you think you see um, firefly lights that are slightly different in color, it's definitely possible. Um, different species use different colors of light. And this often um, it's also pertains to kind of what time of night they're active. The luciferous enzyme that's involved in the production of their light caught the attention of researchers decades ago. Um, and unfortunately for a while, this involved the collection of millions of adult fireflies. Uh, but in the 1980s, researchers were able to produce synthetic uh, luciferous. And so that is now used in a lot of medical research. Um, and this is pretty incredible because it enables researchers to observe interactions within cells. So it's been used for a bunch of different scientific advances. Everything from visualizing HIV transmission to uh, detecting bacterial contamination in milk um, and other food products like meat. This bioluminescence has um, been co-opted for other uses as well. So although most adult fireflies don't eat or aren't known to eat, there are of course some exceptions to this. Females of some Futurist species will actually mimic the flash of other fireflies. And they do this to lure in males for a meal. Um, so other feeding observations are pretty rare. There have been some researchers like Lynn Faust who have documented some species nectaring on um, milkweed or goldenrod and asters. Uh, other species have actually been observed feeding on the sap and floral nectaries of Norway maples. But firefly larvae are voracious hunters. So they are on the hunt for those soft-bodied invertebrates like snails, slugs, and earthworms. And because of this, they can actually be pretty valuable predators of crop or garden pests. And firefly larvae actually eat by um, first injecting their prey with this paralyzing venom. And so that effectively immobilizes the prey and then they're able to enjoy their meal. Um, but fireflies are also a food source for another, um, you know, a number of other invertebrate predators. And this can include anything from spiders and assassin bugs to hanging flies um, and other invertebrates. And, um, and as I mentioned, of course, other fireflies in the genus Futurus. Um, most fireflies are toxic. They have these defensive compounds known as lucibufagans. Um, and because of this, vertebrate predators are less common. They seem to be more impacted by this toxin. And the really interesting thing about the Futurus fireflies, the females that lure in males of other species, is that they actually lack these toxins. So females of this genus eat the fireflies that do have these toxins in order to pass them on to their young and effectively protect them from predators. Fireflies can be found in a pretty wide variety of habitats. 
Uh, you see them in riparian woodlands, desert canyons, um, meadows, fields, residential lawns, soybean fields. Um, they, depending on the species, can be pretty generalist or some are very highly specialized. But the key feature of almost all of these sites is moisture. Um, and so this can come in the form of humidity and dew in some places, but in other areas like the arid west, fireflies are most often found in places with permanent water sources, like a river or a stream. So at this point, uh, you've likely heard reports of declining firefly populations. Um, over the last decade or so, there have been a lot of articles posted with headlines like, are fireflies blinking out and lights out for fireflies? And the general consensus is that people are seeing fewer and fewer fireflies each summer. Um, I get a lot of notes from folks, especially in the East, saying they used to have fireflies all over their property as a kid and they haven't seen them in years. Um, and this seems to be a message that we're hearing over and over again. And you know, while some firefly researchers agree that some populations do appear to be declining, we have a, a lack of systematic monitoring, which means that a lot of the evidence to date is anecdotal. We just lack baseline uh, monitoring data to say you know, that a lot of these populations have definitively declined. So insect declines of all kinds have been making headlines lately, and the potential drivers of decline for fireflies are similar to those of many other insect species. So earlier this year, members of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, Firefly Specialist Group, um, published a perspective piece that kind of explored the perceived threats to fireflies across different regions of the world. So Sarah Lewis, who is a co-chair of the group, um, she sent out a poll to firefly researchers all over the world asking what they thought the, the biggest threats to fireflies were in their region. So collectively, the top three threats that emerge to fireflies are thought to be habitat loss, light pollution, and pesticide use. Uh, other threats, such as declining water quality, invasive species and climate change induced drought and rising sea levels may also be taking a toll. And then when you, you know, include other things like hurricanes and um, wildfires and extreme weather events, and even in some places firefly tourism um, that's starting to build a little too quickly for um, you know, what folks can handle at these different ecotourism sites, uh, this really um, just adds on to the threats for fireflies. So habitat loss and degradation is considered one of the largest threats to most declining insect species worldwide. And this can take many different forms, um, including commercial and residential development, water pollution, groundwater pumping, uh, modification of waterways, habitat fragmentation, uh, this photo actually shows a new development that occurred in what was thought to be the largest known population of the Bethany Beach firefly in Delaware. And this is a critically endangered species that uh, the Center for Biological Diversity and the Xerces Society actually petitioned for endangered species listing back in May of 2019. So in December, we received a positive 90-day finding, and that means the species will undergo a status assessment to determine whether it needs to be listed or not. Um, but things like this that really decimate habitat can be um, really problematic for species that have highly specialized habitat needs and are already found in really few places. Flashing fireflies and glowworms also need dark nights. And they're not the only ones. More than 60% of invertebrates are nocturnal, so they're active at night which makes them pretty vulnerable to light pollution. Um, and actually about probably more than three quarters of firefly species in the US and Canada are nocturnal or active at dusk. And these species rely on their bioluminescent light signals to communicate. The researchers have speculated that this artificial light from things like street lamps and residences and other sources 
may actually be obscuring um, natural firefly bioluminescence. And this makes it difficult for individual fireflies to communicate with each other. Of course, this could have cascading effects and outcomes for species that depend on these signals to find mates or even to ward off predators. In these two photos, you can see uh, sky glow on the left from an urban area at night, and then on the right, artificial light at night as seen from space. And so it's kind of interesting to see, you know, we have much larger populations in the eastern part of the U.S. Um, and this is also where a lot of our flashing firefly species are concentrated. And so there's a lot of light pollution that they have to contend with there. Pesticides are also a threat, and these include insecticides and herbicides. And these two have been implicated in the declines of many insect species, and we think they might be affecting firefly populations. There isn't as much research looking specifically at fireflies and pesticide use, but we know that they can be exposed to pesticides via direct applications to their habitat or through runoff or even by eating contaminated prey. Uh, these same pesticides may also degrade their habitat, even if they're not you know, directly affecting fireflies. Um, and they can also eliminate these larval food sources. So when you think about putting things like molluscicides in the landscape to kill snails and slugs, you might actually be killing um, firefly food as well. So these threats might seem kind of overwhelming. Um, but fortunately, there are a lot of things you can do to help fireflies. First, I think it's really important to understand what fireflies need to thrive. And so in addition to protection from pesticides and other potentially negative impacts to their habitat, uh, fireflies need four primary things. They need some kind of moisture. They need food, particularly for the larvae. They need shelter. And for many species, they need dark night. So this moisture ensures that fireflies and their prey don't desiccate or dry out. Um, like I said, food is especially critical at the larval stage. Shelter can take many forms. It can be leaf litter, underground burrows, rocks, rotting logs, native vegetation, and this is needed at all different life stages. And then dark nights are really important to species that are active at night and use light to communicate. So some of the key actions you can take include uh, protecting fireflies from ground disturbing activities. Uh, being conscientious about pesticide use or eliminating it altogether, providing habitat features that are really important to fireflies, um, and reducing light pollution. And then contributing to community science programs is also a really great way to help researchers learn more about fireflies. Like I was saying, we, there's a lot we don't know about where they live um, or how they're doing, how their populations are doing. So more information like this is really critical. And then educating others and advocating for fireflies in your community can also ensure uh, that their needs are being met um, and that they're being considered by, you know, your friends, your neighbors, and even local policymakers. I'm just going to go through a few recommendations for fireflies. Um, so first, leave the leaves. Like I said, leaf litter is really important. It's um, helpful for shelter, not only for fireflies, but also a number of other species, including uh, bees and butterflies and snails. Leaves also can act as natural fertilizers. Um, and leaving leaf litter and mulch can support other insects that overwinter in leaf litter uh, or, you know, who hunt for alternate prey within the leaf litter. And this also can improve the moisture content of the soil, which as we've talked about is important to fireflies and their prey. And some ways you can do this um, and incorporate this practice is by refraining from leaf blowing or raking uh, and using fallen leaves in place of wood chips for mulch. And I just wanna point out this picture. I think it's really cool to see, um, this is a pyroctamina larva on some maple leaves taken by one of my coworkers and mentioned earlier that pyroctamina are often found on trees and so we think this one might have fallen onto the leaf litter but I think it's um, pretty amazing how well it blends in with the leaves and it's really hard to know that it's even there. So mowing less often may often, uh, also benefit fireflies. Mower blades and any kind of trampling that's associated with mowing can directly kill fireflies. 
uh, especially since both the larvae and egg-laying females spend most of their time on the ground. Males also tend to use grasses and forbs as resting places during the day when they're not quite as active. So if you do need to mow, uh, I would consider setting your mower blades higher so that there is some kind of buffer um, between the blades and the ground, um, or trying to mow when fireflies are least active. Of course, this is usually in the winter, but some places this can extend from fall to spring. It uh, really depends on where you are. Um, in some areas, fireflies might be active almost year round. Um, you can also try to do some sort of patchwork mowing or just leave unmown habitat. And this can really help provide valuable coral resources to pollinators and somewhere for other predators and parasitoids uh, to hang out and take shelter. So it helps a lot of other species as well. Grasses and forbs can provide shelter and perching places. And so grasses and other plants um, that you incorporate into your yard or stoop garden or um, you know, talking with your local natural area or community garden, these can all be really beneficial to fireflies. Uh, shrubs and trees are important. Both provide additional shelter and perches. Trees can actually help block out light pollution, uh, depending on the type of um, leaves or needles that they have. Uh, different species of fireflies will actually signal from different canopy heights. So providing a range um, of perching heights can actually help cater to these different species. And like I mentioned, several species will use tree bark um, for pupating or to overwinter. And this is often trees with really deeply furrowed bark, like hickories and some oaks. And um, it's pretty cool, but kind of similar to monarchs, some species will actually use the same overwintering trees every year. Um, those alignia fireflies, the winter fireflies, um, can be seen congregating on the same ones. Uh, plants also help retain soil moisture and enhancing their diversity helps support, of course, a greater diversity of other insects species and wildlife. And this can help reduce pest outbreaks and provide more diverse food for animals like birds. So fireflies, like many other wildlife species, prefer areas that are a little bit wild. Um, so leaving things like down logs or leaf litter, things that you might otherwise be tempted to clean up can actually be really beneficial to fireflies and other species. Um, you can leave things for signaling perches and for hunting, um, just basically letting some of your areas of your yard stay a little bit unkempt. Or if you manage a natural area or you know, any other kind of outdoor space, leaving these little corners can be really helpful for species like fireflies. Um, some folks choose to incorporate some sort of water feature in, in their landscape, and if mosquitoes are to concern, um, this is a really great way to add more moisture. Um, but you can also just plant more um, trees and shrubs and create some more shade to help increase the moisture availability for fireflies and their prey. Nighttime active fireflies need dark nights. And so it makes sense that eliminating artificial light at night is the best thing you can do to help them. Um, you know, we realize that light is sometimes needed for practical or safety reasons. And if this is the case, you could consider reducing the impact of that light by installing things like motion detectors instead of leaving lights on all the time. You could even shield or lower the lights so that they have a more targeted effect. Um, for example, only lighting up a path instead of a path and all the view landscape around it. Um, you can keep your curtains closed at night just to limit the amount of light that spills out from the windows. Uh, you can also consider swapping any bright bulbs that you might have for dim red bulbs or using a simple red filter on existing bulbs. And um, some research has shown that uh, red light might be the least, um, may have the least negative impact on fireflies. You can actually find more in-depth recommendations for firefly-friendly lighting in a fact sheet that we recently put together. Uh, with Avalon Owens at Tufts University. Um, so we originally put this together in English and then some wonderful partners 
um, from Mexico offered to translate this. So we actually have a, a new Spanish language version that just came out um, a couple of days ago. And so both of these are on our website in our publications library. Whenever possible, pesticide use should be avoided, um, especially things like insecticides, which are designed to kill insects. Um, unless you have some sort of situation where you're you know, looking at economic damage or public health risks, uh, we really urge folks to eliminate or at least drastically reduce pesticide use. Um, you know, if you can consider non-chemical alternatives, um, and then especially eliminating any kind of cosmetic use that isn't really necessary. Um, if you have to use pesticides, working to minimize their impacts to fireflies and their habitat will be really helpful. And you can do this uh, by spot treating weeds or using an early detection system so that you're only putting you know, the, the least amount of pesticide on the landscape that you need. And I think it's good to remember that pesticides have the potential to harm not only the fireflies and their habitat, but again, also that prey that they depend on. So earthworms, snails, slugs, other soft-bodied invertebrates. And ultimately, uh, see what you can do to leave some places a little wild, uh, as dark as possible, as chemical-free as possible. Your best plan of action for creating or enhancing firefly habitat is really to embrace diversity of microhabitat. So this illustration here was designed uh, by Jane Kim and her team at Inkdwell, and uh, it's in the interior of our new um, firefly conservation brochure, which is also on our website. And I think it's really, really beautiful depiction of firefly species that are found all across the US and Canada and kind of in this hypothetical scene at dusk. Um, but it really depicts some of the elements that fireflies need to thrive. And this includes diversity of plants and canopy heights, um, things like leaf litter and underground burrows for shelter. You have some nice grasses for perching, um, a tree with some deeply furrowed bark for overwintering uh, fireflies. And then, you know, these darkening skies at dusk that are free of light pollution. And we even have some water sources in the form of a stream in the background and then um, dew dripping off some of the plants here. Another really great way to contribute to firefly conservation is to participate in community science. Uh, like I said, there's still a lot we don't know about where different species occur, what time of year they're active, how abundant they are, um, what environmental factors may be impacting their populations. And so this is really where you can come in and contribute to our understanding of firefly populations. And there's a few different programs available right now. Mass Audubon's Firefly Watch is probably the largest dedicated firefly program in the US. Uh, and they ask volunteers to help track the distribution of flashing fireflies and other environmental factors that might impact their abundance. So if you sign up for this project, um, you commit to spending at least 10 minutes a week observing fireflies during the adult activity period each year. And so this can just be your own yard. It can be a natural space uh, near where you live. Um, but it's a pretty minimal time investment, especially if you're already planning to be out enjoying the fireflies. As you can see from their map here on this slide, a lot of the observations are east of the Mississippi, which makes sense because they focus on flashing species. Um, they are having some records starting to pop up in the west. Like I said, there are some flashing firefly populations out here. But we also have a western dedicated project. The western firefly project is similarly tracking flashing fireflies. And they are focusing on pyrectomina species. So this program started in Utah, and through, it was through the Natural History Museum based in Salt Lake City. But it's now expanded, and it includes all Western states. And um, you can see from the map there, most of their, their records are still from Utah. I'm not really sure where that record from Florida came from. But uh, all the rest are pretty much concentrated in the Utah, Nevada area. Uh, in addition, the Fireflyers International Network has uh, several different region-specific projects for all over the world. And these are all uh, available through iNaturalist, and so you can use them to submit your own sightings or even reference it for species that might be found in your area. 
So these images um, just show their project pages for the US and Canada. But the nice thing about this project is that it tracks all firefly species, not just the flashing ones. So you'll find some of those deactive species and then even some glowworms that maybe aren't um, you know, uh, reported as much. For a long time, um, there weren't many resources for identifying fireflies, which I think has led to um, the misconception that maybe there's not as many species as we now know that there are. Um, but luckily, this is starting to change. And um, just the last few years, we've had several new guides and um, he's published. So uh, this book on the far left, Fireflies, Glowworms, and Lightning Bugs, uh, was written by Lynn Faust. And this provides a really nice in-depth overview of fireflies of the Eastern and Central US and Canada. And then the center book, uh, Silent Sparks by Sarah Lewis, um, is a really nice introduction to kind of the science and wonder of fireflies, and also includes a brief guide to commonly encountered genera in North America. And then for the West, we have this um, draft uh, compilation by Larry Bushman, another firefly researcher. And he's put together a field guide focused mostly on species in Kansas, Colorado, and Arizona, but it also applies to um, species in other Western states as well. The Fireflyers International Network is also a great resource for learning more. Um, you can read about the community of scientists and firefly enthusiasts that make up this group. Uh, they have a huge library of firefly literature. Um, they host World Firefly Day every year in July, and they also provide keys and field guides for different regions all over the world. And then finally, I just encourage you again to check out the pages on the Xerces website. Uh, many of the topics covered today are discussed in greater length in our firefly conservation guidelines called Conserving the Jewels of the Night. And we wrote this with um, some firefly researchers, Sarah Lewis and Avalon Owens from Tufts University. And then we also have the brochure that I mentioned with Inkwell's really beautiful illustrations and the lighting fact sheet and a number of other resources as well. So as you learn more about fireflies, I really hope that you'll begin to advocate for them in your community and you know, educate friends and neighbors. And this can take a lot of different forms from encouraging the creation or protection of firefly friendly habitats to you know, working with your municipality to pass pesticide and lighting policies that are friendly to fireflies. You could even join or start a local chapter of the International Dark Sky Association. Um, and at the very least, we really do hope that you'll share this information with um, you know, families, friends, neighbors in your lives. And with that, I'm going to say thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this talk. And I'm going to open it up for questions in just a moment. But first, I just want to encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out the other videos and webinars found there. Um, um, so these are just a couple of links. If you want to reach out to us about fireflies, you can just email fireflies at xerces.org. Um, I think Rachel said the evaluation would pop up when this ends, but there's a link here as well, and then also a link to our YouTube channel. Thanks so much. Thank you, Candace. That was a great presentation. We do have a few questions. Our first one, is it true that there are places in the world where fireflies blink in unison? Yes, it is true. Um, probably the most well-known places are in places like Southeast Asia, but um, like I was saying, we actually have a few different populations of synchronous fireflies in the States as well, and the most famous one is probably the Great Smoky Mountains um, light show that happens every year, and unfortunately, they had to cancel their lottery this year um, for folks to go see it because of restrictions with coronavirus, but hopefully that'll be up and running again next year. Thank you. The next question, would firefly larvae take on grubs like Asian beetles? Um, I'm not sure what, like, <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> Maybe if the larvae, would they likely eat Asian beetles? Oh, um, I'm not sure, they might. We don't know a lot about what firefly larvae eat. Um, some species are snail specialists. 
uh, while others are known to eat worms, but I don't, I don't think there's been a lot of research into specifically what they eat or if they, you know, hunt really particular species or how large of a um, prey they can take down. Okay. Um, here's our next question. Should we discourage children from catching them for fun? <laughs> That's always a hard question. Um, <laughs> I myself have some very fond memories of catching fireflies as a kid. And, you know, I think with something like this, just really cautioning them to be gentle with them. You know, these are live animals and maybe capturing them and looking at them and admiring them, but then letting them go and not, you know, putting them in jars and keeping them in your room, even though I know it's um, very enticing as a kid. <laughs> um, but, you know, fireflies, um, yeah, they're living animals, so just, just taking care with them. That is a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> Next question, where is firefly tourism taking place? Um, so it's taking place in a lot of areas, and you know, it's especially been focused on the sites with synchronous fireflies, just because it's so amazing to see you know, thousands of fireflies lighting up all at once. And so there are a lot of sites in Southeast Asia and other places of the world. Um, more recently, there have been, um, there's been a lot more attention on some of the sites in Mexico. And then um, in the US, we have Great Smoky Mountains National Park, as well as a few kind of satellite sites at a few different state parks um, and preserves, uh, mostly just clustered around um, that, that same area, around Tennessee, North Carolina. Great. This next question comes with a caveat, and that is that they may have missed it earlier in the presentation, but they are wondering what portion of species are day active and are they more likely in some geographic areas? The second part of this question is what's their conservation status, generally speaking, compared to those nocturnal species? Yeah, so I think I said something like 75% of fireflies are in the US and Canada are active at night. So you know, maybe roughly a quarter are day active species. Um, and they, you know, we have these species from coast to coast, um, but in the West, we do primarily just have the day active and um, the glowworm species, not the flashing species. Um, and, you know, we, there's a lot we still don't know about these species, even the flashing ones. And we are actually working on a project with, um, the IUCN to assess the conservation status and extinction risk of um, a, most of the species that are found in the US and Canada right now. And we're finding that there's just not a lot of data to you know, really assess how these species are doing. Um, my guess is that you know, light pollution is impacting a lot of our flashing species and our glowworms, but obviously uh, these day active species aren't impacted by things like that. But because they're active during the day, they might be more affected by um, other things, including, you know, like daytime management of sites um, uh, and things like that when they're on the move. Interesting, thank you. The next question, are LED lights worse than incandescence? Um, yes, LED lights are really problematic for <laughs> fireflies, which is unfortunate because they're so energy efficient for us. Um, but they're just so bright that um, it really, you know, kind of drowns out the signal of, of fireflies communicating with each other. And so really um, talking with Avalon Owens and other folks who've been looking into the impact of light on fireflies, um, it seems like using these red lights and red filters, while not perfect, is still better than um, using things like LED, which has a lot more light in the blue range, which can be really uh, negative for fireflies. Thank you. The next question, does the Citizen Science Firefly app incorporate research grade iNaturalist observations too? And is there a way to combine? The Citizen, um, are they, I'm not sure if they're talking about Firefly Watch or, I don't believe the two, I don't believe Firefly Watch or the Western Firefly Project incorporates iNaturalist observations. Um, and I can follow up with the folks who work on those to see. Um, 
But yeah, I know at least for us, like when we have been mapping out Firefly distributions, um, we've been using research grade iNaturalist um, records. And it's been really nice because that Fireflyers International Network project, um, there are a lot of firefly specialists all over the world who are vetting and identifying species that are reported on iNaturalist. So it's, it's nice to have um, these really solid IDs on that program. Hmm. Interesting. We have a time for a couple more questions. One here, can you describe underground burrowing in more detail and how we can help provide this feature? <laughs> I've had this question before and I'm not sure. So yeah, the females and the larvae will um, take shelter in these burrows, you know, during the heat of the day and um, just as general shelter and overwintering. And so some of these are, you know, they're, they're using burrows that already exist, to my knowledge. So something like um, empty rodent burrows and other natural depressions in the soil, and they may not be very deep. Um, and so for right now, we're just kind of encouraging folks to, if you do have a few bare patches of soil or some bare patches with some sort of overhanging, you know, grass or forbs to provide some protection, um, try to leave that for them. Um, if you do have, you happen to have rodent holes in your your yard or lawn, um, these might be used by fireflies and other, you know, many other species as well. But um, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a lot of work looking at that, although I should definitely double check and see um, if there's more information available. Okay. This one, it's from um, a woman who lives in central Virginia and it's a very natural setting. And she said that she only ever notices fireflies light up when flying or perched, but why might she be missing the larvae lighting up on the ground? The larvae are really difficult to see. Um, and even the adult females who may um, also light up are really difficult to see. And often you have vegetation blocking, um, you know, your line of sight to them. It's like, when you think about it, it's kind of amazing that the males ever find them <laughs> because they're flying around searching for these tiny pinpricks of light, which, you know, helps you understand why light pollution can be so problematic because a lot of these females and even the larvae are so faint. Um, but I think also, um, especially things with like larvae, they might be pretty well dispersed in a landscape and you might only have a few of them. And so it's really, in some ways, almost just luck to come across them. Another question about the larvae. If fireflies flash to attract a mate, then why do the larvae flash? So we think that the larvae flash um, to deter predators, um, since they are often underground or under the leaf litter and in dark places. Um, could be that they evolved to have this flash to kind of scare off predators and say like, hey, I'm here, I'm poisonous, don't bother me. And, um, you know, evolutionary ecologists think that this um, system of flashing to ward off predators is what kind of became used uh, later on by adults to start um, communicating for um, courtship. And then another question about um, lighting specifically, and you may have mentioned it, but do males light up? Yes. Yes, males light up for many species. A lot of times with the glow worms, um, it's only the females that produce light and the males um, most often don't. So they're, you know, just flying around looking for these, these females um, uh, light signals. And then of course the day active ones um, don't flash or make light. Some species do have these kind of, um, they still have uh, lanterns, you know, what we call the, the light organs, but they aren't really used for communication anymore. Um, but yeah, males, especially of the, the flashing fireflies, you know, our lightning bugs often do flash. Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question. And then if your question doesn't get answered, please feel free to email fireflies at xerces.org. Um, just have a couple quick ones left. Maybe we can get through them. Um, but someone who lives in San Francisco, they're wondering if they can find fireflies in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
That is a good question. Um, you, I'm not sure if you could see them in the city proper, but we do have records of species like the um, California pink glowworm, which I think is a very cool species. Uh, and those can often be found in um, the leaf litter of uh, like oak woodlands. Um, so maybe going out and searching those kinds of habitats, um, you know, at dusk or night. Um, one really nice feature of iNaturalist, I find, is that you can look at the map of firefly species and kind of hone into your area and see what else has been reported from your area. So you can get, get a sense of the species that you might have and, you know, where, where people are finding them and what time of year as well. Okay, the next two questions are sound like really good trivia questions. Um, what is the brightest firefly species? <laughs> the brightest firefly species? I have no idea. I bet, <laughs> I bet someone like <laughs> Sarah Lewis or Avalon or Lynn or someone would know, but I, I don't know. <laughs> Stumped the expert. <laughs> and then how many different colors of firefly lights are there? Um, well, they're, you know, they, they light up along the, the wavelengths of, um, you know, they can be green or yellow or red or amber. And a lot of this has to do with the eye of the viewer um, and how you perceive light. So, you know, some people argue that fireflies that appear blue, like there's this glowworm um, called the blue ghost that the males fly around and have this really eerie, long glow that some people swear is blue and others say is green or green-yellow. Um, they can really vary across the spectrum. Interesting. Well, thank you so much, Candice, um, for answering those questions and for a wonderful webinar. And thank you all for joined us who joined us today. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone.